and our reaction to what happens in the world, our response to it, makes the world. He says that the fear which we feel, that sort of panic, enters the earth and it has a deleterious effect upon the earth and breeds disease. So, Joseph, one of the other uh, practices that gets explained in your essays and book is the idea of the four ideals, which is this idea of thinking on one of the four religious figures uh, in history, some of the biggest, and connecting one's uh, thoughts and ideals and correct me if I'm wrong, kind of making a connection to them in physical space where they might be uh, most identified with around the world historically and bringing in something of their uh, essence and uh, being into one's own being. Is that about right, would you say? It's absolutely extraordinary. Um when I was first introduced to it, I could hardly believe it. What the GF says in that exercise, and this is also part of the reason that it was important to share it. I mean, there is something already in reality of being a great deal. And uh, the estimable Frank Sinclair uh, refers to something similar, Gurdjieff said in 1948, in his book, of The Life More Aligned, and I think also in the other one, Without Benefit of Clergy. But it's extraordinary. What Gurdjieff says is that when people pray, their prayers go upwards, up in the atmosphere of the earth. And he means this literally, that when we pray, we send emanations, fine substances, towards the ideal to whom we're praying. So if, for example, I'm praying to Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, the emanations mount towards Jesus. He seems to say that there is Jesus, an emanation of him, above the atmosphere of the earth, an ideal. He calls it an ideal. Now, he doesn't say how it got there, but he says there's an ideal. And in that exercise, four ideals are taken, Muhammad, Buddha, Lama, and Christ. Um, and he says that when people pray towards these ideals, he says their emanations have different strength, different vivifyingness. It's like if you shoot an arrow. I, if I shot an arrow, it wouldn't go terribly far. If a real marksman shot an arrow, it's going to go many times further. And so some of the prayers of the believers barely rise at all. Other prayers mount further, further even than the atmosphere of the earth and mount towards the ideal. And he says that those emanations as they leave the earth, are dispersed, but then they gather in a sort of a foyer or reservoir of substances. And these are very, very fine, very subtle substances. He says that a person can't just enter into contact with the ideal himself directly. That's a very advanced thing. But people like you and I can enter into contact with the reservoir of substances. And we can ingest those substances into ourselves. So they're a very, very fine, very powerful food. And they are the higher hydrogens among the highest. They are probably the highest hydrogens of impressions it's possible for us to receive. And we enter into contact with them and we digest them 
by using creative imagination to establish a link between a limb of our bodies and the ideal. So a thread which serves to connect each of the limbs to one of the ideals. And then we attract or suck those substances into ourselves. But it's not just enough to do that, he says. He says you also have to know how to assimilate the product when it's there and how to blend it with the substances in your body. So this is a super fine substance. We already know that with some vitamins, if you receive them, you have to have a certain other substance in yourself so that you can digest and assimilate that vitamin. Otherwise, it just passes through your body. Good analogy. Yes, something similar with this. It's not just enough to have the contact between my right arm and Muhammad. I have to also have the substances in myself which will make these higher hydrogens and I have to know how to mingle them, how to blend them. I have to know where in the body to blend them and I have to know what to do with them when they've been blended. Well, that information is in the four ideals exercise. And then very importantly, Gurdjieff said to Mr. Rady, and this is not in Madame de Saltzman's book, he says to Mr. Rady, and then you remain 10 to 15 minutes in the collected state, digesting them, because otherwise all that work will be lost in vain. They will just evaporate from your body. So an extra work is needed, remaining within the atmosphere to digest them. And just to add to that, I, I don't recall exactly if that pertain if if what I'm going to say pertains to the four ideals or to the preparation, but isn't there also a, a kind of asking that we that those substances get protected and that gain is secured until the next yes. uh, ingestion or or process? Yes, that's that's um, that's part of it. And Gurdjieff have very specifically said in the Paris transcripts to his pupils at that time, that they could take an ideal and ask their ideal to help them and to help them keep the results of this substance until the next time that they uh, came to it, which is why when I set out the four ideals exercise, I brought all that together in the commentary mm -hmm. because Gurdjieff often gave things in fragments and then, um, it was for us to put the fragments together to make the mosaic. So that's and and um, that's a good point that, that you just raised because this comes back to, uh, again, to th why this book was really necessary is because all of these fragments were basically dispersed and some of them have been um, or can be found in, the, in these previously published works that you've talked about. Um, a little here, a little there, um, you know, a whole bunch in the, in the Paris meetings. But, um, but a lot of these fragments presumably were given out in perhaps even one, one on one conversation between Gurdjieff and, and his pupils. And as a result of a number of things, including the, the secrecy of the Gurdjieff groups and the, the hesitation and um, hesitation to communicate uh, amongst each other and to share um, openly that a lot of these fragments um, have been lost. So we we don't know we don't even know how many how many exercises there are. For instance, how many um, if there were to be if it, if it were if it were possible to make a collection of you know all the exercises that Gurdjieff gave with uh, that could be almost universally applicable because um, as you point out in the book the Gurdjieff would give individual exercises to to certain individuals um, and, and say oh this is for you this exercise is for you no one else do it um, but there were others that he gave to everyone so we have no idea how many there actually were and um, so but luckily luckily we do have the ones that were preserved and um, and that 
that are able to now be published. But um, where did I want to go with that? Um, it comes back, yeah, what I wanted to uh, point out is that the that a lot of these exercises either have been lost or would have been lost otherwise. So uh, could you comment a bit on the attitude of the more um, kind of the official Gurdjieff groups and and um, their 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 perspective, their rationale for for keeping for for not sharing these things, and maybe could you also share if you've received any negative feedback since the public publication of the book um, as a result of you know sharing these things? Yeah, first of all, um, part of what the book tries to do is by using. Um, an academic standard, which does have its value to try and show what it was that Gurdjieff brought with these exercises, the nature of them and the principles. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, to bring into contrast or relief those practices which are being used by Gurdjieff groups, which are not from Gurdjieff. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that new methods were introduced in the 1960s. And I'm not speaking against those methods as such. All I'm saying is they are not from Gurdjieff and it should be known that they're not from Gurdjieff. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all. If Mr. Adi gave us something which wasn't from Gurdjieff, he would say, I, I got this from here, I got this from there. He never confused what came from Gurdjieff with what came from other places. And in, Gurdj and in the Gurdjieff groups, that has to some very significant extent happened. Uh, so the genuine Gurdjieff exercises have been displaced by new exercises. Um, I, I'm not speaking against those new exercises. I'm just saying be clear and candid about what comes from Gurdjieff and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And if you do study what Gurdjieff brought, and it was clearly meant to be studied, you will find something very valuable which I don't think appears without that type of study. The next thing about that is that I have not myself received any uh, negative uh, comments. E everyone that speaks to me is um, positive about the book. Good. I'm not saying people aren't negative, I'm <laughs> sure, but... A lot of people are highly critical. All I'm saying is they don't say it to me. Mm. I did once, I did not long ago have correspondence with a very highly placed person in the official Gurdjieff groups. And this person said to me, Gurdjieff never wanted the ideas to be published. And I wrote back saying, I'm sure he didn't want them to be published, but <laughs> he thought they were going to be used. Yeah. And, um, I said, besides, I said, the most important exercises were already published in the third series. And then many more were published in Madame de Saltzman's book and in the transcripts. What's wrong with commenting on those and then um, preserving these ones which came from Mr. Radium, which would otherwise be lost? Surely, I said, the question is the quality of the comment, whether it's true to... Um, the standard, whether it represents or misrepresents. So that's how I see it. And, and the person uh, didn't reply to that. Um, and the, this person, to give them their credit, they actually said, yes, I can see an argument that at the time Gurdjieff gave them, he thought that they would be used. Oh, no, he didn't say, so this person didn't say that. He said, I can see an argument that at the time Gurdjieff gave them, those were those circumstances and that we're now in different circumstances. So mm -hmm. um, this person at least acknowledged that. 
what I think Gurdjieff wanted was for his pupils to speak one another with yeah. one another and exchange what they had. And can I say too that um, I was pretty much influenced in this, I think, well by Mrs. Staveley because what happened is um, I met Mrs. Staveley in 1996. I'm very glad I did. Um, but she told me that she started to collect the authentic Gurdjieff exercises when she realized that they were being lost and forgotten. And so she started then to put together in one place all the exercises that she and Jane Heap had from Gurdjieff. And she also spoke to the Bennett people who were in Claymont. Mm. Uh, she spoke to pupils of Rena Hands and Irmis Popoff, and she collected exercises from these people so that at least there would be a collection of what were the authentic Gurdjieff exercises. And so to this day, Mrs. Staveley's group in Oregon still use the authentic Gurdjieff hmm. exercises. So there is a collection, a collection out there, um, but I, I, I suppose that, uh, well, obviously those ones haven't all been published. Um, and uh, I don't know, do, do you... Do you foresee a future when um, Mrs. Staveley's kind of collection from all these different sources would ever be um, published? Or or is it just a, from your perspective, is it just a good thing that at least they've been preserved? Um, well, they're being used. That's the point. Yes. So I can't see them being published while they're being used. Um, if anyone uh, is serious and, and they can work with the people from Oregon, um, they will learn those exercises mm. in due course. Good. Uh, what I wanted to do was to preserve the exercises for Mr. Aidy, which were being lost yep. and being used. Uh, the only people that use them now are uh, the people that meet with me and the people that have read them in my writing. And um, apart from that, so far as I can tell, they're just not being used because I have contact still with people who were with Mr. Aidy. Um, one of the people who had been with him the longest, over 20 years, could not remember at all anything about how Mr. Rady brought the preparation or the exercises, could remember nothing. Hmm. And that's what happens. If you yep. don't have a place inside you where it can find its place, it just evaporates. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I guess this comment is going as much to Joseph the priest as it is the student of Gurdjieff. Um, it does seem quite interesting to me that your analysis and information has become available to us at this time. Uh, a lot of the things that we talk about on the show on a very mundane level is becoming better people and developing ourselves. Uh, on another level, there is, you might say, a great deal of spiritual struggle uh, or, uh, you know, some might say spiritual warfare. Uh, we're in a time of great change. And if you have any thoughts about those terms and, and these times we're living in and, and how these practices may or may not be a part of our fortifying ourselves and um, and fighting the good fight, uh, I would appreciate any thoughts you had on that. Yeah. I'm sure that we are living in times of, as Bennett said, accelerating change. And that means that everything is accelerating including the rate of the downward spiral. Mm -hmm. The um, destructive forces which are loose are increasing at an accelerating rate. And at the moment, um, we're experiencing 
the release of an elemental force of panic. Um, this is something which Gurdjieff did speak about and Bennett preserved, that there are elemental forces such as panic and our reaction to what happens in the world, our response to it makes the world. Now, in, in very, very real ways, um, he says that the fear which we feel, that sort of panic enters the earth and it has a deleterious effect upon the earth and breeds disease. So in a time like now, when panic has been released, it's all the more important that we make the efforts we can for at least our own individual sanity and balance. And that will have an effect in society. I don't believe it can be as easy as harmonic convergence or things like that. <coughs> Excuse me. There's an element of wishful thinking there. And I don't criticise the motive behind it at all. People mean well. But it's harder than that. Uh, we can all hold hands and sing. And it may not make any difference whatsoever. But if we are working on our being, that will make a difference. It will affect the person next to me. And then how that person is will affect the person next to them. And there can be a ripple effect. The hazard, the um, situation at the moment, is that the positive effect, the positive work, the creative, the conscious work, might not be strong enough to balance the destructive forces. So, and this is something which I think is a general rule in history, the greater the destructive forces loose, the more the constructive forces can appear. Um, it's very striking that when our Lord was teaching in Palestine, there were reckoned numbers of demonic possessions. The two of them go together, the appearance of the Lord, the appearance of the devil. Um, and it goes in the reverse direction. There's little doubt that Gurdjieff believed that his ideas and his methods were needed for the time in which he was born. <coughs> Excuse me. And also for what was going to come afterwards. Mrs. Staveling and Bennett picked this up. Uh, so did Dr. Lester. You may have heard of Dr. John Lester. He was another pupil of Gurdjieff and uh, of Jane Heap. But Bennett, Mrs. Daverley, John Lester, they all said that we are living in a critical time of transition and the world needs things like the Gurdjieff work more than ever before. So what might have been hidden has to be brought out so that it can have a greater possible effect. That's one aspect. Look, there's so much that I could go on with there, Ilan. I'm reminded of how Uspensky said that in the ancient Egyptian civilization, the schools, that is, the forces of consciousness were big and the society was small. But now it's different. Society is big and the schools are very small. Mm -hmm. So we're fighting against immeasurably great forces. I'd like to take that, take that global picture and bring it down to... Um, um, that the individual level, and you, you commented on this already, Joseph, um, in relation to panic. Um, I want to ask you about negative emotion, because um, that plays a big part in both the, the theory of, of Gurdjieff's ideas and in the actual practice. And just to start out as a kind of preface, I want to 
um, I want you to talk about a bit about what Gurdjieff actually means about negative emotion, because um, for me, um, there are, well, I'll, I'll give a story um, that I believe it was, yes, it was Catherine Hume in her book, um, uh, An Undiscovered Country, her, her autobiogra autobiography, autobiography um, where she talks about after World War II, she had been working, um, I believe, in Germany um, in the kind of recovery effort after the war. And she'd come back to, to meet with Gurdjieff and had told him about um, the concentration camps and just the, the level of inhumanity and destruction that had taken place during the war. And she said that a look came on Gurdjieff's face, and I believe she described it as the wrath of God. Um, as if there was, a, like, a, and then the way I picture that is a deep sadness combined with, all, like, with, um, with wrath, with an anger that, that humanity could, could descend so low and engage in such barbarity. And it was a, a piercing, uh, well, if not a piercing look, a look that's, that stayed with her. And she said that when she went back to the, to, to Germany and, and saw more things, that that, that image of, of Gurdjieff, um, hearing that stayed with her, and I say that just as a as an example of what might be termed anger or a negative emotion. Um, but then the but the, but I doubt that many people, many of us, would have or can experience. Um, well, I doubt there are many people in the world that would have that reaction, that that uh, the depth of that reaction um, to to that level of inhumanity. Some just it just. Um, washes right off of them like, uh, you know, like water off a duck's back. Um, so I would like you to comment a bit on what is negative emotion? How does it, um, you know, what are the, the kind of grades of, of emotion that we find in ourselves? And what, what do we do about the, the, the negative emotions that we feel that, uh, that come up in everyday life that are perhaps not um, kind of beneficial for our, our well-being and our, and our just daily living? Yeah. Um, as I understand it, Gurdjieff said that the way man was designed, we would basically have three brains. The body, which is run by the um, moving instinctive brain. Uh, and so the bodily brain looks after everything to do with the body, the way it grows, the way it digests food, and so on. The second brain is the intellect, the mind, which is able to register, to compare, and then to extrapolate from what it's registered and what it's comparing, to make plans, um, and to devise things. And then the third brain is the feeling brain. Now, the bodily brain, the body and the intellect do acquire information. The body tells you a great deal, um, tells me the quality of what I'm touching, whether it's too hot for me, if I have to get somewhere cooler, or if it's too cold, if I need to put on a cardigan. Um, the body's always giving me information which I need for my health. So, for example, if I eat food which is off, um, I spit it out straight away. The body does that. The brain, the intellect, gives me information I need. Um, that's quite obvious. The feeling gives me a different type of information which it's harder to pin down. It tells me something about the quality of what I'm dealing with. So that, for example, if I see someone, like if, for example, I see my brother, the brain tells me that's my brother. But the feeling response when I see my brother is positive and affirmative because I have this affection. Um, the feeling will tell me something about what I'm dealing with. So, for example, um, if I see a snake, the feeling tells me dangerous and I react. I, I fear the snake. 
I run the other direction. I don't stop and think about the snake. By the time I've worked out intellectually uh, what to do, I could be dead. So the feeling animates me very quickly and tells me, run away. So feeling tells me something about the quality of what I'm dealing with. And ordinarily, Gurdjieff said, feeling would be a pretty good, reliable indicator of whether something was going to be harmful or beneficial to me in that respect. But what happened is that our feeling has suffered a sort of corruption, what we call negative emotion. Now, negative emotions are not true emotion. He says they actually formed in a funny sort of way as a disease of the body. So you know how we say this is disgusting. Well, disgusting literally means it has a bad taste. Just as we tell thing, say things have a bad taste and we should then not eat them, we react to certain situations in that way with a hatred of them, a resentment, and we have developed ourselves refinements of this, jealousy, envy, anger, things like that. And they work in us as a disease. Instead of being able to look at something or interact with someone and see, yes, this is good, that's not good, that I'm not so sure of, this I need to study, this I need to find out more about, we can have a negative reaction of hatred, all these other things, pride, envy and so on, which actually stops me from obtaining the accurate information I should be able to obtain. My response becomes a partial reaction. It's only a part of me which is blindly reacting to something which it doesn't like. And yet, maybe if I was more reasonable, I'd be able to gain something from the situation I'm in. I'd see it a little bit differently. You know how it is that if people don't like you, they don't like anything about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might just be one thing. They just might not like the look of someone's face. And then they don't like anything about them. Um, it's a power of irrationality in us. And it takes us away from being able to use our intellect properly because the negative emotion reacts so strongly, as with the example of the snake. Emotions are made to override the intellect, to make you act because that's dangerous. You've got to get away from there. Or, But what happens is we get that reaction with people and events in life where it's inappropriate, we can't function properly. So negative emotion is the enemy of our consciousness. That's the first part of what you were speaking about. And of course, I don't want to give the impression that's a comprehensive black and white mm -hmm. answer, mm -hmm. but it's at least part of how I view it. The next question is how we work against negative emotion. Well, the short answer is consciousness and conscience. And Gurdjieff um, said, ultimately, there is no difference between consciousness and conscience. Consciousness is awareness in the intellect. Conscience is awareness in the feelings. And if we have awareness in the feelings, we won't be able to hate, to resent, to be subject to pride. So how do I come to conscience? Well, the first thing is to realize that I am asleep in my mind, in my sensation, and in my feeling. To realize that these negative emotions are harmful. I never received anything valuable from my negative emotions. All they did was raise new walls of ignorance and misunderstanding between myself and other people. And then when I understand that 
I don't want these negative emotions. When I have an aim to be conscious, to be conscious, to have conscience, to have feeling, when that's my aim, then by necessary implication, I don't want negative emotions. So then I can struggle against them. And there are many ways of doing that. One is to observe them. And the more present I am when I observe them, the less they can manifest because it's like darkness. Um, the light will shine in the darkness. Um, but um, the light has to be strengthened, which again comes back to the importance of the preparation and the exercises, that affirmation of I am. The more conscious it is, the more conscience can be available, the less negative emotion, the more clearly I see in relief then my negative emotions when they appear. And then another very important aspect of this is the work on chief feature. Um, most of my faults revolve around one chief feature. It forms as a sort of photographic negative of my essence, the true I. There's a real me and there's a false me. If I can see the false me, and work on that, a lot of things fall away with that. And then my essence becomes clearer and can appear more clearly, more fully. Uh, look, uh, I've only just touched the surface mm -hmm. of it, but uh, that's an introduction. Yeah. No, that's good. Thank you. Well, I was interested in, in, uh, learning about your your road to the priesthood because there would seem to be a number of overlaps between the work on the self as presented by Gurdjieff and a spiritual understanding and reverence of of the world and and those things that are higher so there there is a lot of overlap it would seem between the two and uh I'm, I'm assuming that there is uh, in your vocation a, uh, in part, that it's informed by your Gurdjieffian background and training. And I was just wondering if you'd feel comfortable discussing any of Most that, Joseph. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when I was about three or four years old, I had a mystical experience. <clears throat> and I had no doubt at all, except that um, God existed. God was three in one. And that, um, well, there was an experience of very profound compassion, unconditional compassion, no doubt whatsoever. But as I grew, as I was growing up, there were a lot of uh, problems. And as I say, um, I was neurotic. There's no doubt about that. Um, and I became a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> a direct, result, direct result of neurosis. <laughs> yeah. I became a lawyer. When I was, now, uh, incidentally, when I was young, I felt I should be a priest. When I was very young, I felt I had a vocation to be a priest. Um, when I was about seven or eight years old, a priest came out from Lebanon and stayed with us, and I felt I should be a priest. But as I grew older, um, I didn't. I opted to become a lawyer, and um, then, as I said, I'm eternally grateful that I met the eighties, <laughs> and. Um, it was only when I met the 80s that I started to understand Christianity more correctly. I'm not saying I do understand it fully. Um, I'm discovering things all the time. And in particular, uh, Bennett um, had perspectives on Christianity which are absolutely extraordinary. 
and which I'm studying now. But I started to understand Christianity better and the sort of um, issues that I'd had started to disappear. Now, um, I'll try and keep this a little bit short, but after Mr. Rady's death, um, the group started to um, work more closely with another group which was established by the foundation. It was a foundation group. And they sent someone out from New York every year and we worked with them. The result was not splendid. Um, the two groups um, tried working together and uh, the only reason they really came together was because they both started disintegrating and they got so small. Mm -hmm. I don't say that to be disparaging or pejorative. That's just the reality. Mr. Eighty, at the time of his death, had somewhere between 85 and 90 pupils. I think they had about 40. Um, they certainly don't have 40 now in Sydney, the two of them together. Um, and so... I, I left that group. Uh, I didn't feel it was a group anymore at that point. And Gurdjieff does say in In Search of the Miraculous, there's no magic in being in a group if it's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I knew I had to work on Mr. Rady's book, um, The Blue Book. It's published now by By The Way Books. I knew I had to work on that book. I had to do that um, for Mr. Aidy. He'd wanted it. And as soon as I finished that, a door to the priesthood opened. Mm. It was one-on-one. Um, -on -one. That's mm. why I went into all those details. They might, they might have sounded um, irrelevant, but they weren't for me. I, I finished what I had to do for Mr. Aidy, and then a door opened into the priesthood. I and I felt this is what I have to do now. I have to go into the priesthood. And Mr. Rady had said to me that the priesthood was essential for me, meaning part of my essence. He had said that. I don't think he had the uh, priesthood quite so literally in mind. <laughs> he may be a priesthood as uh, a mediation between earth and uh, heaven, but he did say that to me. He said, there is something essential in you which has an affinity with the priesthood. So um, that would be quite a name, to really be an essence priest, a being priest, not just a priest in name only. That would have horrified Mr. Aidy. To be a priest in name only, that would have really horrified him. Mm. But it was extraordinary. Once I paid that debt to him, the door to the priesthood opened. Um, and then I feel in some ways as if this book is repaying a debt to Gurdjieff. And now having done that, another door has opened. And I'm able to work with um, far more people, far more effectively with um, Gurdjieff's exercises. And they're getting... They're receiving something from it. But also, if I can say this, um, and this comes from Gurdjieff, Christianity tells me what to do, and Gurdjieff tells me how to do it. Now, it's a bit of an oversimplification, but that's the um, basic thing. And another thing, too, is that for me, my priesthood is an external uh, reminding factor. You know, in the third series, Gurdjieff says he stopped using his powers of hypnosis to mm -hmm. give himself an external reminding factor. Uh, and Mr. Ray had that with his lungs. I, I can tell you that story if you like. It's very interesting. Sure. But uh, his operation on the lungs, yeah, my priesthood is that for me. Okay. When I met Mr. Ray, one of the striking things was that he was always coughing. 
He was always wearing a heavy coat. He always had a hat on his head. Um, even in the middle of summer, he wore a suit, a tie, and this big coat. And we soon, you soon found out that he couldn't stop coughing. He needed oxygen, things like that. And it turned out that what had happened was that in 1951, he'd had an operation and the doctors had removed the whole of the right lung mm. and I think one third of the left lung. Wow. Now, that left him a very severe invalid. He'd been an athlete up until then. He said to me, I was an athletic man. And then overnight, I became an invalid. That's why he couldn't let any drafts get on him. So even if he was perspiring badly, he had to wear the coat, had to wear the hat on his head. And then it was only after he died, actually, that Dr. Lester, who had known him in England, said to me, yes, but you knew what they found when they pulled the lung out. Oh, sorry, I'll just back up for one second. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rady always said to us that he gained a great deal from the operation because he had to always pay attention to his breath. Because it was so difficult for him to breathe, he had to pay attention to it. And that helped him to remember himself. Mm. So he only ever said that he never complained about the operation. Only once did he say to me, and in a matter of fact way, without any self-pity, I had been an athletic man before that. Then overnight I became an invalid. And he was saying that to me to indicate what can happen to you in life. Anyhow, after he died, Dr. Lester said, asked me, but didn't he tell you what happened, what they found out? I said, no. He said, when they pulled the one and the third lungs out, they found that the problem was really quite minimal. One of the, he didn't need to have the um, pulmonectomy. It had oh. been entirely unnecessary. It could have been dealt, his problem could have been dealt with another way. Awful. It stunned me because he'd never breathed a word of complaint. He'd never said a word about it. So what an incredible reminding factor for a person to say, I will not complain about this unnecessary um, operation, which turned a 50-year-old man into an old man overnight. Now, I'm not saying I have anything like that, but the priesthood is, for me, a reminding factor, and I try and take it that way, and I try and think, well, I want to be worthy of being a priest. Um, I want to be a good priest, not to be a priest in inverted commas, as Gurdjieff would, said, would say. And it's interesting how often in Belzebub, uh, good priests figure. <laughs> uh, in fact, in the 1931 edition, there's another priest, the Armenian priest, Thermoses, who was taken out of the final edition. But um, he has friends, you know, when he wants to stop sacrificial offering, his friend is a priest. Um, Gurdjieff seems to have had a very ambivalent attitude towards priests, but I think it's explicable on this basis. A good priest was very good, but not a good priest was really awful. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I want to, well, I want to make a comment first. I like reading, um, even though I don't read nearly as enough, uh, nearly as many of them as I'd like, I do like reading biographies because you can get a sense of another person's life path and how certain things might have influenced them and the choices that they made. So I'm wondering um, if, from your perspective, if you know of any um, public figures who might have been influenced by Gurdjieff's work that we can at least look to and look at their life as kind of an example of what uh, the Gurdjieff work can do for a person. And if there aren't any public figures like that, then it are, if there are any accounts, um, maybe m memoirs or autobiographies that you can recommend to, to just get a, a picture of some of the lives that have been lived um, kind of following this way. 
Well, Hurricane, the boxer, uh, Hurricane Carter, I think, um, in his autobiography, he mentions how important discovering the Gurdjieff ideas was to him. Mm, wow. That's a very good example. Um, apart from that, there are certain people who had um, an acquaintance with the Gurdjieff work that you wouldn't necessarily know and that they tend to be rather silent about. Um, Peter Brook does say something, you know, that book, The Threads of Time. He does make some references to Gurdjieff, de Seltzman and Jane Heap. And he's quite clear about it. Uh, they're only a small portion of that biography, but nonetheless, they're quite clear. Um, the, the book which I think is really important is Bennett's book, Witness. Um, have you read Witness? I haven't read it yet. I've, I've, I've read a few of his other ones, but I've got that one on my book pile to read as soon as possible. So I'll move it up. Okay. Um, as I think you know, I'm working with uh, Carol Cusack mm. and Tony Blake on a new volume of Bennett. It's the 50th anniversary of his death in 2024. And we're being very generously assisted by George and Ben Bennett, his sons, Great. and uh, some other people who knew him. It's extraordinary how much has been left out of witness, mm -hmm. but Bennett deliberately wrote, wrote witness to say what he had found about life and death. And... It is a book that, like Belzebub, you really need to read several times. But of all the biographies written by people um, who knew Gurdjieff, I think Witness stands out um, head and shoulders uh, above the rest. Again, I don't say that to um, put down the other books. I mean, Undiscovered Country is a wonderful book. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more that that particular one is very good. And um, do you know the Chechevich book, uh, A Master in Life? Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's also very good. Now, the French is even better. They left out a lot of things from the um, English book, uh, things that they thought might be too spooky, like the uh, Catherine Mansfield ghost story. Mm -hmm. uh, they just left it out. And why? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But that's a good one. And uh, even, notwithstanding the, um, <clears throat> if they had asked me to supervise the translation, it would have come out a lot better. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, that one is out of print as far as I know. I, th I think uh, we should uh, get a lobby together to get a, a new translation done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the English book, sorry, the French yeah. book, Tulane Mirage. And now, now what they did do, they did order the um, uh, essays because Chechevich did not write one continuous book. They mm -hmm. did put them in some order. That was good of them. But they also left out a lot and they yeah. inserted a few things, as I mentioned in my book. I, I understand why they did it. I'm sure their motives were good, but I don't like that. Just no. present the material the way it is. And if you wish to add an appendix or a forward and say some other things, do that yourself. But make yep. it clear that yep. that's you. That's not him. I can't think of any others offhand, Harrison. If I can think of any other books, um, any other good uh, biographies or autobiographies, um, I'll let you know. We, we haven't been well served in that respect. I don't like any of... I couldn't recommend any of the books on Uspensky. Mm. Um, and yet clearly, Uspensky is very misunderstood. Mr. A.D. spoke to us about Uspensky. He knew Uspensky um, for about 10 years. He knew him in the last years of his life. He says Uspensky was a very warm person. And Frank Sinclair, to his credit, says something similar. He saw a film of Uspensky and realised that he misunderstood Uspensky. Um, we haven't been well served for Arras. There hasn't been a good biography of Arras. I mean, 
Taylor did make some effort, um, but someone needs to build on Taylor's book and produce that, uh, produce a good biography of Iraj. So I just can't think of any hmm. others offhand. No, that's okay. Those are those are some good places to start. Um, well, then there are some people who um, are public figures that haven't written at all. I don't think about their work, and just the one that comes to mind is um, oh, and now his name's forgetting, uh, escaping me. The guitar, the guitarist from King Crimson. Um, oh, Robert Fripp. Yep, yeah, Robert Fripp. Fripp. Um, I mean, yeah. he's open. He's open about his work with Bennett, um, but um, but I don't know. I don't. I, I'm I'm not familiar with, or I don't think that he's got a. If there's a comprehensive biography or um, or memoir that he's written, um, but yeah, I I don't know. I'm embarrassed to say I'm not very fond of his music. <laughs> uh, he was, of course, an excellent guitar player. I mean, one of the very best. But um, yeah, kind he, of weird. It produced um, not quite to my taste. Uh, although, as I but look, I I have to say I don't know him. Uh, I know people who know him. And uh, all indications are is that he is in his own right an extraordinary person. Mm -hmm. um, he had a group called Guitar Craft, I think it was. Um, and he, he's clearly been a very big influence on a lot of people. And he had a very noble role in preserving some of Bennett's material. Um, Tony Blake, who is a friend of mine, and I believe also... Uh, a much better friend of Robert Fripp says that Fripp was instrumental in saving some of Bent's diaries from destruction. Mm. So all hats off to him for that. Yeah. Great. Um, maybe to, I think we'll wrap up. We've been, we've been going for almost, I think we've either reached our limit or passed it. Maybe as a, as a final, um, as a final question, um, could you just give uh, a bit more detail um, on that current project you're working on? So with uh, with uh, uh, Blake and Cusack, I believe you said you're working on this this volume for the, yeah. the 50th anniversary of of J. G. Bennett's death. Could you maybe just uh, give an I give a little bit more detail on what exactly? Maybe you don't want to go into too much, but what that project kind of entails, and maybe. How long do you think you're going to be? You're going to be working on it. When do you think it will uh, bear fruit? Yeah. Um, first of all, when I finished the book on contemplation and sent that off, it wasn't very long before the idea appeared in my head that I had to do something on Bennett. Um, and I don't know where the idea came from, but. No idea has ever come to me like that before. I don't want to sound all eerie, <laughs> but um, it did just appear in my head as a decision. And I hadn't even been contemplating it. It just appeared in my head as a decision. This volume had to be done, and I had to ask Carol Cusack and Tony Blake to um, work on it with me. Um, Carol is a professor of religious studies at the University of Sydney. Um, her understanding of modern religious movements and in particular Western esotericism um, is extraordinary. Um, she's up there with people like Henrik Bogdan um, and that crew. But she's also here in Sydney and um, she's prepared to make time to speak with me. So uh, that's a very good thing. And she's also an expert on Gurdjieff, one of the world's leading experts on Gurdjieff. And she knows Tony Blake and gets on well with Tony Blake. Tony is, well, I shouldn't praise him too much because doubtless he'll see this uh, <laughs> video and he'll doubt my sincerity. But um, you know that a lot of the, this is just the fact, a lot of the books we have from Bennett, um, talks on Beelzebub's tale, spiritual psychology, deeper man to name but three of the most important they only saw the light of day because of tony blake mm -hmm. um and blake did he was one of um bennett's right hand men um for quite a period of time and uh his intellect's extraordinary uh his range of acquaintances is extraordinary and um so the three of us are trying to put together 
a volume which will meet the academic standards but do more than that. We also want it to be an inspiring work. Um, it hadn't originally been thought of as a 50, 50 year anniversary thing, but it's turned out to be such a large project that I think that makes sense. Um, I hadn't realized how much was involved in it when I started. Uh, Bennett is extremely important, not only as a pupil, but in his own right. And I hadn't realized this. People tend to think of Bennett as being something of a maverick. Uh, mm -hmm. People, particularly in the foundation group, say, Madame de Saltzman held the true line. Bennett was a maverick. Um, well, I didn't know Madame de Saltzman, and I wouldn't be one to judge her. I'll speak about facts, but I wouldn't judge her. But um, neither would I judge Bennett. And what Bennett discovered was really quite extraordinary. And his range was huge. Just recently, um, I received an email from someone speaking about Bennett as a movement, um, working with movements. I hadn't known that uh, he was able to bring that to the movement's classes. Now I do. But his intellect, uh, you know, this idea of um, inclusion without exclusion, his insights about the, you know, in the dramatic universe. But it didn't stop there. He kept going on. Systematics, this type of thing. Um, Bennett is truly, um, sorry, let me just backtrack. Mm -hmm. I was told by someone who knew him that Hassan Shushud, the Turkish dervish, said that Bennett was the most important Western mystic since Meister Eckhart. Now, I, I can't judge the Western mystics. I don't have enough understanding to be able to say that. But the fact that someone as clearly advanced as Shushud would say that, that's impressive. I don't think he was comparing Bennett to Gurdjieff, and Bennett didn't compare himself to Gurdjieff. But I'm hoping that this, we're all hoping that this volume will show a lot of people that Bennett's stature has been very much um, underappreciated, that what he brought was far truer to the essence of what Gurdjieff brought than people understood. And I think we're going to um, shed very new light on Bennett. Things are still coming to um, mind, uh, sorry, to light all the time, new things mm. appearing. Um, and incidentally, there is a John G. Bennett Foundation, which um, Ben Bennett and uh, his wife and also George Bennett and some others uh, maintain. It's doing some very, very good work in preserving the legacy. Um, and we're hoping now to develop it with this volume. And with uh, Tony and Carol as co-editors, I think um, we have the germs of a good mm. pilot team anyway. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, with that said, I think... I think we'll end it there, Joseph. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you kindly. And we'll be in contact about any further discussions we might have. But I do appreciate speaking with you. It's, it's beneficial for me to speak with people like Ilan and yourself. Great. Well, thank you. We enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. And good luck, good luck with uh, the, the rest of the work on that book. Yes, Thanks. on the on the Bennett book, on the Bennett work. Uh, just really quick, um, have you um, did you read? Uh, is it uh, William James Thompson's PhD dissertation? Um, uh, I haven't read it. I no? have it. Um, okay, I've downloaded it. I I found it, um, but I haven't had a chance to yeah. read it yet. What I'm trying to do is first of all read everything which Bennett himself wrote. Okay. Uh, so at the moment, I'm working through the journal Systematics, uh, mm. which is a lot of work. And yeah, OK. All right. <laughs> Great. Well, all right. Well, take care. I'll look at the camera this time. Take care, Joseph. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. All right.